Australia from this one, please, in the hall. Welcome to the Spark Talk Series, the sixth uh, talk series that we have been organizing from the Nepal Entrepreneurs Hub. We do this talk series to inspire entrepreneurs and uh, ourselves as well. But before we begin, I think it's always good to do a little bit of exercise, to raise our right hand up, or the left if you're a lefty, then reach into your pocket, take out your mobile phone and put it into the silent mode. <laughs> Uh, a lot of times when we have a good discussion, we tend to have our mobile phone suddenly, not deliberately, but uh, the mobile phone is on and uh, it disturbs others. So have you done that? Yes. Thank you. Never Alone Entrepreneurs Hub, it's a, it was started by a group of uh, like-minded individuals who came together to foster entrepreneurship in, in Nepal. We started by organizing startup weekends, couple of events in, in Nepal. And uh, we continue to do that for eight, even so the past three years. In 2012, we had this discussion. And uh, then we have been having a lot of meetups, uh, doing coaching, uh, mentoring, uh, and being part of other activities in Nepal. Uh, what we wanted to do when we came together was to see that uh, the entrepreneurial activity over the past 15 years have really accelerated in the last five years. But then, with that, there has been a lot of fragmentation. So everybody is working in their own group, and uh, they're trying to do things on their own, which is a good thing. But uh, we need to come together uh, and uh, work together as well, so that we can come together and see that there is a common objective, then I think there's a lot that can be achieved. So that's why uh, we have this Nepal uh, Entrepreneurs Hub. I am Suman Shakya, for those who do not know, uh, I'm one of the co-founders and director at the Entrepreneurs Hub. The other members are Ravi Priyal of Islington, Pritin Rajoshi of Rizkulaji, uh, Impal Shakya, who is an independent consultant with uh, Ken, and uh, Mohammed Tambur of Cloud Factory. So we need in our individual capacity of the doing a lot of things. So we would like to take this forward. The reason why we did this uh, event is to do a panel discussion. Uh, we got to learn from uh, the show that uh, Kamalji from Japan is here, who's come here to start a new venture, the new IT venture here, working on IPTV. TV. We'll talk a little more. But then we got to learn that uh, Ken and uh, students are also coming to uh, Kapandu. So why not do a discussion where they've already invested in their company? So we thought, uh, why not do a final discussion on, uh, on how to get ready for investment in, in the bank? So moving forward, the structure of the panel discussion would be that I would ask each of the speakers to uh, that we'll ask, ask a question to each of the panel and uh, they'll get 10 minutes to uh, respond to that. Uh, in the introduction, they can talk about what they've done, rather than me doing the introduction. And then we'll put the, uh, the floor open to the audience. So on the audience, uh, uh, one person, uh, whoever wants to question, will have volunteers to go around with the mic, and uh, they can ask a question. Uh, please keep it short, introduce yourself, and then ask that question. So moving on to our speakers, I would like first to, to the introduction Good morning, everyone. It's a delight to be here. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak today. Uh, my name is Jim Earhart, and uh, I was asked to talk a little about enterprises. So some of my personal experience uh, relates to different uh, business models that I've worked in and how uh, scalable those models are. I think there's a lot of entrepreneurism that's taking place here in Nepal. A lot of good ideas, a lot of companies being founded, some of which I'm sure will catch, uh, take root and, and begin to grow and are ultimately going to face uh, challenges in, in scaling uh, the enterprise. So I wanted to relate my personal experience over 28 years or so uh, to that issue and to the business models that are behind that. So as part of my introduction, I'll just give a couple of observations around uh, scale and, uh, and we can build on that from the questions. So as I said, I've been uh, 28 years in uh, the information technology industry, 
Uh, I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, attended engineering college, and then started work with uh, what's now Accenture as an IT services uh, company. And I worked there for uh, 27 years, so it's quite a long career with a single company. So uh, my career at Accenture went through three, I would say, fairly distinct phases. Uh, originally, Accenture essentially did consulting services, uh, and I did that for uh, 15, almost 15 or more years. Uh, consulting is, is by definition a sort of a one-to-one -one business model. So any individual consultant is usually working with one customer, and it's really about what you personally bring to the table, your relationship that you develop with that customer, and supporting them, delivering uh, you know, your personal equity uh, as part of that uh, relationship. Uh, so by definition, uh, consulting is, is not a very scalable business model. It's, it's really based on the number of people that you have that are managed to, to provide personalized service. And my roles there went from developer to systems architect to project manager to uh, client account management, but always working with one particular customer at a time. And about uh, 10 years ago or so, uh, I was asked by Accenture uh, to uh, go to India and work with them in their development centers, delivery centers in India. Uh, and I did that for seven years, uh, based in Bangalore. Uh, but my team uh, was ran out of offices, uh, six offices in India. Uh, by the time by the time I left there, as well as two in the Philippines and three in China. Uh, and you know, the team that I grew there was over 20,000 people. So uh, that was scalable business model. What we did there was what we call um, factory services. Namaste, good morning. I am Kamala Dikari. Uh, I am the CEO of UIG Venture. Actually, I am the engineering graduates from the Indian. And after that, I came to Nepal. And I think that time, only the job for the engineers was for the lecturer, you know, teaching in the colleges. So I follow that. And after that, I got opportunity to go to Japan and the Tokyo University for my further studies. After I go to Japan, what I felt is I got the opportunity to interact with the technology and the things on the studies that time. I was just trying to look what can be done in terms of business. You know, I didn't know anything about business, but something was driving me, you know. Um, I should, you know, take something that I can develop, uh, that I can create the business for that, I can create the market for that make it as a business. So the things changed is like uh, Japan government, they had planned to make 100% optical fiber all over the Japan. Their target was on 2011. By 2011, uh, they were, they had the planning to complete the 100% fiber to home. And when I was in university, I thought like how that infrastructure can be used a simple way kind of things is not enough. <coughs> so one of the things and the heaviest thing was the video. The video was the challenge that time. So I thought we should, I should think something like, you know, that uh, I can plan to utilize that infrastructure that is video. So I didn't have anything in mind and I love the cricket. So that time what happened is some event cricket match was going on. We, we didn't find an opportunity to watch the live events. Just we were just uh, seeing the scores, you know. So what I clicked is uh, why not to make the live event, you know, just to show, you know, through the IP to see the live match that's going on in the India uh, and just to watch on the uh, in my university lab. So I asked my professor. I'm thinking to do something, so would you allow me to, you know, give the resources and, you know, take the people. So I have invited around 50 people, and what I did is I set up, you know, some kind of very small uh, transmission, like I did uh, in encoding facility in the India, and in my lab, in my university lab, I have invited the people, and I set up, you know, similar uh, reception device, you know, and it all was connected through VPN. And that time we were using uh, ISTN in internet. And that was the first time all people saying, really, we can 
who was the man, is that true? So they were surprised and they liked, you know, the event, they enjoyed, you know, all the four or five hours, you know, watching the cricket. And then they encouraged me, why don't you bring it as a business? Then after that, I think that was the time in 2004, YouTube came on 2005, May, right? And it's around in the mid of the 2005. So I start trying to find the you know, people, the right people. I think that time it was very, very difficult to start the company in Japan. Later on, you'll explain on that part. Like, the, you should have the money to start the company because <laughs> there was no any space for the startups, you know. You don't have the money at that time. But now the situation is changed, of course. So I tried to find some Japanese uh, partners or friends, you know, who can put some money or who can give me some space in the company where I can do the project. So my first project, I started I started talking with the India and for the licensing content part and all this thing and I got the license for the cricket event and I got the license for one or two Indian channels also. They said really in IP, we, they said they don't have any agreement. So I made the draft and sent them and that way I started uh, the IPTV on a very, very small scale. And later on, what is the important thing for the business of what I felt is we should make some prototype, we should make some project as a success model. Like not only in terms of technically, like sometimes being the engineer, what we make, sometimes we say, oh, this is very exciting and we love it. But that may not be accepted by the market. So that's why we need, so this is the time for us to open and invite the big investors and their expertise and we need to open the door or we need to be prepared to bring the big companies. They, they think Nepal could be one of the opportunity for them. That's my you know, experience and if I am there later on, I will share if you have anything to ask. Thank you. I'm a board member of Kamal's company and NITV, OIT Venture in Japan. Uh, for over 20 years, well, let's see, 20 years now, I've been in uh, technology investing and research for technology investing. The last 16 years as a venture capital uh, investor, and there's really been dramatic changes over that time in terms of the investment industry, in terms of the technology industry. Our initial focus was on research-based approach to investing, where we looked at the technology, the trends in the technology, trying to determine what will be the future technologies that are most important and then pursue investments in those spaces. Um, and this was a, a great focus of ours and evolving from that, uh, what we really found was our greatest value was the strategic value we bring to the companies we invest in because we knew their industry, because we knew what they were trying to do and ultimately uh, because we know globalization. Uh, the company I work for now, Sunbridge, was started in 1999 in Japan. Uh, but we've done investments in both the U.S. and in Japan. <coughs> Invested in about 75 companies uh, in both markets. Uh, total of close to $120 million invested. Uh, some very good successes over that time as well. Uh, in the mobile space, we invested in flaring te technologies in the U.S., which was bought by Qualcomm for $805 million back in 2004. Uh, we invested in Salesforce.com in the U.S. and enjoyed the success of their idea there. Uh, we also co-founded Salesforce.com Japan and built that business up from the first employee uh, to uh, 10 years later being reacquired by the parent company for about $775 million. Um, and in total about uh, six different IPOs and four major acquisitions across that time that have been very successful for us. Uh, my main focus now is really working on uh, globalization of technology businesses. And uh, to be more specific about that, as I said, we have a presence in Japan. Uh, we have about 100 people in Tokyo, a small group in Osaka. We have three businesses in total. One is 
uh, venture capital investing, which is my main focus. Another is uh, technology incubation. Nepal CEO, Chief Eternal Optimist. <coughs> so I look at opportunities. I look at Nepal with a different set of lenses. Currently, I run Beat Management. Um, this is a management consulting and an advisory co company. We work in Nepal, Bhutan, and Rwanda in Africa. Also, I chair the Nepal Economic Forum. It's a platform like uh, the any hub for people to come and discuss on the larger economic challenges, find uh, interesting research and uh, <coughs> discourses to get engaged with. I think that's practically that's a space we are trying to fill in because um, we have political parties in Nepal and we have political organizations and multiple of them, you know, in every sector we find them and there are federations of those multiple political organizations. So we are trying to fill up the space because that's that's one key thing uh, that we do. And uh, yeah, for those who have been uh, running Deep for about seven years and before that I was involved with one of the largest business groups in Nepal, Solti Hotel, earlier the Solti Group, and then later on split as Tara Management, working with a multiple number of joint ventures. In my own career, I've seen a lot of successes of foreign joint ventures in Nepal, be it Surya Nepal, be it um, you know, trading businesses like Sipravi, be it um, Bodegoshi Power Company, which was the first IPP uh, independent power producer in Nepal, and a lot of other businesses. So, that way, I do believe, and it's great to hear inspiring stories from Kamal and uh, you know, also learn from global experience. So Nepal is a place where you can do a lot of things. We currently, we do advise a lot of uh, global companies to navigate their space in Nepal. We I also represent a global company called Power Group Asia, which operates in 21 countries. It's a Washington, D.C.-based firm that uh, helps global companies to navigate spaces in uh, 21 countries in Asia. So that way, I think the challenges we see in Nepal is not very different than in other countries. The challenges uh, are there, like in uh, one of the Nepali restaurant chains wanted to go to Delhi, and uh, we realized that to start a restaurant in Delhi, you require 42 permits. And then I think we just, you know, with the scale of firm, I mean, which, you know, you go to Jamsikil and you can start a restaurant one day. You know, that's, and then when you look at, then you start comparing ease of doing business. And that's why, that's how we try to, you know, sort of uh, look at what can you do in Nepal. And, and as global capital is going to look for countries like Nepal, because, you know, if you look at the markets like US, Europe, it's all, it's not giving you those returns. So you have to find your market. So you are either going to Rwanda, you're going to Angola, you're going to Ivory Coast, or you're going to, you know, you're coming to Nepal. So it's a comparative between all these countries. And then you start looking at all these countries and you say that, hey, you know, Nepal is not too bad. You know, when we look at, you know, we've been working in Rwanda for four years, we still feel with all its open policies, it's going to take another 15 years to come to close to doing things like what you can do in Nepal, especially in terms of the human capability, the capacity.